Hi, I'm Sarah from The Upcoming. Such a pleasure to be able to speak to you about this, you know, incredible film, completely unique, completely unexpected turns that I, I didn't see coming when I was watching it. So um, yeah, congratulations on, on, on creating something so incredible. Um, maybe you could just kick off with a brief introduction there. For people who don't know anything about Amulet, can you give us a glimpse of what they can expect? Yeah. So Amulet is a horror film set in contemporary London about a, a man who comes from um, an unnamed foreign country um, called Thomas. He's sort of living down and out in London. He's welcomed into a very sort of derelict home by a young woman and her elderly mother who needs someone to kind of help them look after the house, essentially. And um, uh, this young woman, it turns out, is very much kind of uh, in a potentially abusive relationship with her elderly mother who lives, who lives on the up floor and is, um, is, is, uh, is very sick. Uh, and then a potential sort of love story starts between him and this young woman, Magda. But then at the halfway point in the film, um, absolutely everything that you know and understand about all the characters in the film uh, changes and it reveals itself to be a story um, about the wrongs of the past and how that they're, they're righted. Mm. And indeed, so, you know, how did you decide that you were going to make a horror film for your kind of first feature um, uh, that, that you, you're directing? Because um, I know you've done a short film before, um, but what made you think that this was the right story and the right genre to, to for your first feature? Um, well, I so I made my short uh, like eight years ago, I think nine years ago. And then I had a whole, I wrote a whole load of scripts <laughs> in lots of different genres. Um, but I think that when you're trying, so trying to make your first feature, like you really, really have to keep the budget as low as possible. And quite a lot of the films that I was writing were kind of mid budget films that were very much the kinds of films that I had started out acting in when I was much younger. So some of them were like novel adaptations and things like that. And, you know, they sort of were progressing, but not quickly. And some of them, you know, I struggled to get interest in them. And then, you know, uh, somebody just said to me, have you thought about writing a horror film? I love horror. I have always, you know, been a big, a big fan of, you know, particularly kind of quite sort of weird films, you know, I'm a big Cronenberg fan. But I think because I'd not acted in that space, it wasn't the first thing that kind of occurred to me. Um, so then I sort of went away and I just thought, yeah, I'm going to write. I mean, obviously, there'd been this amazing kind of surge of women moving into the genre space amazingly successfully. So I'd, you know, been watching Raw and The Babadook and um, films like that and Revenge. And, and I just thought, well, I'll just, you know, have a go in that space and write something in that space. And the idea that I had and what came out was a film was was Amulet and was a film that also was quite achievable in terms of its size and I think that those two things kind of came together and gave the film a kind of momentum it was a genre film you know it was also a film that I largely shot in one house you know and and those things came together and made and gave the film a kind of you know a momentum in the development which just meant that you know straight away we were kind of you know within a year we were in production and nothing that I'd written other than that had ever had that kind of turnover that quickly. And so it sounds like you've been thinking about, you know, writing and, and directing your own film for a long time. So what do you think um, made you want to make that transition from acting to kind of being behind the camera? And what do you think that you can take from, from being an actor to, to, to doing that role? I think I probably, like if somebody had come to me when I was 17 and said, are you interested in going to film school? Would you like to do that? I think I would have been very interested in that. But... I still think, well, you know, it was certainly true for me, like, you know, I, a lot, uh, not that women think about doing it, you know, there's just, at the time, there were so few women who were directors, and it was just not something that really occurred to me, and the entire culture around film, you know, I was at an all-girls school, was not really there in the way that I think it often is in communities of boys, and like, it just didn't occur to me, like, if you were creative, if you wanted to tell stories, being an actor was much more a visible kind of potential career path. So, you know, I, I went down that road and I, you know, I love acting and it's something that I really, you know, enjoy, but it doesn't completely feed you creatively if you are also interested in kind of narrative storytelling, you know, because 
that's a that's a different thing you know so I I wrote all through my 20s you know um basically just trying to kind of get better at it and then and that culminated in me making my short when I was like 29 30 and then you know obviously this you know journey into into making a feature but I think it you know it really helps having been an actor for sure I mean like when I approach someone to give them a note I I hope I I'm like highly collaborative you know and I I still work with directors all the time who come on set and they say to actors you have to stand here the other actor will come over and say their line you wait two beats and then you speak you know and you can be a good director in that way there's obviously loads of great directors who've directed actors in that way but it's horrible for the actors it's awful it's not there's no level of kind of collaboration that goes on at all it's not a conversation and you know and I think that when you are an actor and have been an actor you you understand what that feels like and you know and I think that that can hopefully create a much more kind of filial and collaborative environment on set Mm. and I wanted to hear a bit about how you landed on this incredible cast because it kind of centers around I guess like the three uh, central figures and you've got such a you know you've got Alec who obviously we will have seen um, in particular in God's Own Country um, working another writer turn, with another writer turn director, um, Melda Staunton, you know, absolute legend. And, you know, at first it's quite surprising to see her in the nun role. And then obviously when you, later in the film, it kind of, she sort of makes more sense in the other role because it's kind of more suited to what we've seen in her before. And then of course, Carla, and they're all kind of difficult roles to play. So how do you, do you decide on, on these three particular for your three main roles? Well, the casting was unbelievably easy for this because, you know, they. I sat with the casting director, she said, do you have anyone in mind? And I said, well, I wrote the um, um, Sister Claire role kind of with Imelda in mind, but I mean, she's not going to do it. So like an Imelda type. <laughs> she said, well, why don't we ask her? So we asked her and she said yes. And I... Um, Obviously, that was amazing because I I kind of did write the part for her in mind. Um, Alec was one of the first people that she suggested to me. I obviously was familiar with him because of God's Own Country. And again, I just thought, well, of course, you know, he's this unbelievably sympathetic character, a uh, man, and has this, you know, incredibly sympathetic face and manner. He just feels so emotionally open. There's no way that you would imagine that he was harboring any kind of secrets. And that's exactly kind of what you need for the film. And also he's the kind of actor where I think it's, you know, it's very difficult for actors because it's their job to defend their character. That is your job, you know, to stand up for them, to defend them, to kind of, you know, realise and rationalise who they are and to kind of be their advocate. But we can't really, ha we couldn't really have that in this film because, you know, we needed the actor to completely accept and understand who this man was, every facet of his character, and not really feel like he needed to kind of stand up for that <laughs> you know what I mean like and um, just be very kind of clear about who it was that they were playing and Alec was you know he's a incredibly intelligent and um you know very very um uh you know well easy actor to work with just really really nice guy who's he's you know he's very highly collaborative and so he was absolutely able to accept who Tomas was and what he'd done and um you know play the truth of that always Carla, I, I mean, when I saw her name, I remembered her very much from the from the Blade Runner films. I thought those scenes in the films really stood out stood out to me. I'd also seen her in Wetlands years and years ago. She's an unbelievably brilliant actress, and she brought a lot to the role that was not on the page. You know, she um, was able to kind of when I sat and had a coffee with her because we met um, to talk about the project. You know. It was mainly her talking. She was like, what about this? And what about this? And who is she? And like really wanted to drill down into the kind of mythology behind it. Um, and she brought so much to it. Like the section where she's where she's dancing, she does the sort of, that was all her. Um, she was just an amazing collaborator who was really able to kind of, I, I think, you know, extend and, and, and deepen the role uh, from the page to the screen. She was incredible to work with. Mm. And what looks really fun about making a horror film is that you can get so creative. And, you know, I wondered, you know, did you take inspiration from other filmmakers, particularly in, in the way the film is shot and the score? Um, and I like the fact, you know, you use the kind of, um, you know, we often have like the haunted house in, in, in a lot of films, but you kind of put your own twist on a lot of these 
um, tropes that we've seen in other films. So maybe you can talk a little bit about the look and feel of it. Yeah, well, um, so Laura, um, the cinematographer and I had a few sort of references. One big reference was the tenant, uh, Polanski's The Tenant, and then the other one was Possession, the Zalowski film, just because it feels like a film that goes to a very <laughs> intense and kind of crazy place at the end. And also, you know, it's situated the flat in that film. It's situated in a world that you know and recognize as being very kind of um, sort of suburban, for want of a better word. Uh, and the sort of like the griminess and the kind of sort of depressing dampness of the kind of of a British house that's always kind of you know the wet on the inside of the windows and the black and the black mold everywhere all the time because of growing it in a damp country we really wanted the kind of feel of that and then I guess Hellraiser as well because that film again has that kind of very British feel and sensibility to it those are all big references for us um the music I mean, the experience of doing the music was just like extraordinary to me because I think probably less than uh, most directors coming to it for the first time, I'd probably not done as much work on the music as I sh should have done. I mean, uh, coming to it as an actor, you know, that is one part of the process that, you know, obviously you have absolutely no involvement and nothing to do with at all. I mean, like very occasionally a director will send you a track to listen to, but you know, that that's that's very much a rare a rare thing. Um, but then when we started working on the music, I think the only music I sent her was the Under the Skin, uh, tra uh, the Mika Levy's soundtrack for Under the Skin. That was the only thing that I sent because I was like, I'd like something that feels, you know, quite spare. And actually what happened was that we had this amazing thing where our sound designer and editor and and our composer essentially ended up making a piece of work together and so the music and the sound design essentially are one in this film um and that you know as i understand it now is quite a rare thing and not that usual but you know that that was something that um i came through sort of quite organically because the house and the you know objects in the house and the um the the idea of sort of like Thomas's shifting sense of reality and like, you know, the, the you know, part, part, pieces of dialogue becoming disconnected from when they're spoken and things like that. We're all, all became part of this idea of the house becoming a slightly more fantastical place, less realistic and more, and more supernatural as the film progresses. Mm. I mean, I'm almost out of time, but um, I was mainly, you know, wanted to ask, there's such incredible themes running through it and the fact that it does keep subverting our expectations and we're never quite where we think we are. Um, so I wondered what you think those key themes are and, and why do you think it is that, you know, particularly female directors find horror can be such an incredible vehicle to kind of, you know, discuss meaty issues rather than being kind of on the nose about like, you know, issues, you know, violence against women um, or psychological issues. You know, horror can be such an amazing way to kind of you know explore these 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 things well i think a lot of the things that happen to women are horrific you know and and horror is a way in a way is a better temperature you know check of the experiences of being female than drama is you know like if you sit and you watch a film you know a, a dramatic film where a woman has a baby in it it somehow doesn't feel as accurate as the experience of labor to me as watching you know Rosemary's Baby like that's that's a bit more like the way it is I think you know and, and the trouble is that like the the temperature is so high sometimes with the feel, female experience of you know of fear of sexual threat of the things that happen to your body the, the fact that your body is in this constant state of transformation throughout your life that feels very animal you know, that to me is closer to the experience of watching The Fly than it is mm. to watching a straight drama sometimes. You know, that feels closer to what it feels like to be female to me. But, mm. you know, um, I guess sometimes when you raise the temperature very, very high in drama, you end up with melodrama. And that is something that people still have quite an uncomfortable kind of relationship with, particularly in this country, which, you know, we, where we like to have our emotions kind of dialed right down. So it sort of feels easier to move those very extreme feelings and experiences into the genre, into the horror space than it does, um, you know, in, 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 in a purely dramatic film. Mm. And I like the way that, you know, like Alex, Alex character, it's almost like he's convinced himself that he is this sort of protector, you know, he's managed to kind of rationalize his own behavior to himself, but also, you know, the film in a way 
becomes a vehicle to kind of play out the justice that maybe women don't get in real life, but you can kind of, through a fictional form, you know, find justice in a different way. So do you think that's also kind of partly true what the film does? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I think that there is, and I'm sure that, I hope that there are women out there who sort of feel the same. There is a sort of kind of, of masculinity, which is extremely dangerous to women, uh, which, and those are men who see themselves as female protectors, as the protector of women, that that kind of, you know, hyper-masculinity characterizes itself as the kind of noble protector of, of, of um, you know, innocent and vulnerable females. And that those men are often the biggest threat to women and that is something that I think that men often don't reckon with in and of themselves you know that they characterize men who are violent to women as men who hate women but they don't characterize men who are violent to women as men who are often have a very highly idealized view of women mm -hmm. you know and that that is something that I think I've always felt and maybe came out in the film and yeah it's you know the the film is an act of catharsis you know mm -hmm. it's like I had a choice of what to do at the end and I thought I just want a very very extreme form of revenge you know mm -hmm. and that and that for me is the kind of the pleasure of the genre space as well is that you're allowed then finally to kind of have some kind of psychic or kind of karmic reckoning with the things that you feel angry about um which you know drama doesn't afford you but then that's obviously the kind of joy of working in in a supernatural space that it, you can you can do what you like mm. and just very quickly can you tell us what you might be working on next are you still going to be doing more acting or are you going to continue directing yeah i've been i've been, i did a tv show this year which hopefully we'll have a second season of which um is about to come out i think in about a month or maybe two months which was for stars which is called becoming elizabeth which is about uh, the sort of teenage elizabeth the first and i play mary tudor who becomes mary the first in that show so that's sort of been an ongoing job for me and then i have a lot of other scripts and writing and directing projects all at various stages which um hopefully will kind of move forward in the next next year or so amazing well it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you thanks so much for sharing all that with us and can't wait for everyone else to see this film as well